Hello and welcome back to the MRS Lab podcast, the show from Fletzimar, where this year we'll be investigating how research and insight can make a big impact on the important topics that shape our daily lives. I'm thrilled for this episode to be joined by two members of the Young Persons Sustainability Collective, or the YPSC for short, a part of the Market Research Societies and More Network. Nikita Simone is a senior research executive at The Big Picture, and Lisa Mai is an account director at Headland Consultancy. Welcome both of you to the show. Thank you, hi. Hi. Nikita, I'll come to you first. Um, for our audience, can you give a bit of a brief introduction uh, to yourself and how you came to be a founding member of the YPSC? Yeah, sure. So uh, like you just said, I'm a um, senior research exec at The Big Picture. So I've been there for about two and a half years now. Um, and I have always kind of been very much involved in sustainability. So have brought that into um, The Big Picture when I was working there and had a green team and stuff like that. And the MRS set up an event about, um, I don't know, about a year and a bit ago, I think. Um, and I didn't end up going to it, but I was very keen to keep following up and following up and hassled Mel from from the Anne Moore um, Society. So we then set up this uh, Young Person Sustainability Collective off the back of that. And it's kind of, yeah, snowballed from there. Fantastic. And yeah, we'll get into some of what that snowballed into here pretty soon. Uh, but before we do, uh, Lisa, can you give us a brief introduction um, to yourself and how you came to join the YPSC? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say my professional role had a few twists and turns, uh, including, well, moving to the UK, first and foremost, uh, and uh, quitting a job in consumer research as I became more passionate about sustainability, because I thought that didn't quite work together for me. Um, and working part time, following that, uh, going back to university, doing online classes, learning more about sustainability issues. Um, and as part of my, I guess, sustainability ambitions, I also got involved in um, MRS, all things they had to say about sustainability. And then I did attend that um, event. And yeah, uh, on the back of that, now we have the Young Person Sustainability Collective. And I think some of those um, those decisions, it sounds like you've taken um, are really hard for a lot of people, you know, on balancing uh, professional careers with um, ethical views and how it all fits into this um, narrative around sustainability. And we will we will get into that as well. Um, but before we talk about the YPSC specifically, I thought it'd be good to start with a bit of your perspective on some of the current challenges that we face in terms of sustainability, the climate crisis. So in your words, um, how would you describe the the current ecological, environmental and sustainability crisis that the world faces? Just a, just a small small question to, to get us started with. Starting <laughs> but, with um, the easy ones. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think it's really interesting, actually, because the other day that film called um, The Day After Tomorrow, I think it's called, aired and I'd never seen it before. But that's like really, really old and is super ahead of its time in terms of showing like the effects that some of our consumption and stuff like that has on the world. And, you know, that was so ahead of its time and we're still kind of catching up with it. And I think about prior to COVID, things were picking up in terms of sustainability and it was on top of everyone's agenda. And then it's as COVID came, that was more important and it slipped down a little bit. And now there's like the cost of living. And again, it slipped down a bit. So I think we're kind of in a in a place now where we're, it, it needs to, that conversation needs to pick up a bit more. There needs to be a little bit more done because ultimately there are, you know, insane fires happening, insane heat, earthquakes, so many things that are, you know, as a result of, of a lot of our um, consumption and, and many other things. So it's a bit of a, it's, it's, we're in a definitely a moment of crisis for sure. And Lisa, what are your thoughts on, um, on that where we are today? Well, I guess the only thing that I could possibly add to this is, um, you know, from, from what uh, Nikita mentioned about, you know, our consumption, our, our way of living, and how this relates to um, the ecological crisis, I think uh, it, it's become quite clear that there are two sides of the same coin. It's one crisis, 
uh, made by collectively all human decisions and our indecisions as well. So if we want to address one, we have to address the other. So um, I, and I think that's one important thing as well, that we have to get away from defining sustainability only as environmental sustainability, because there is no environmental sustainability without um, without equality, without social justice, etc. I think that touches on um, a concept that I, I particularly like in this field, um, the triple bottom line, the idea that sustainability isn't just environmental and ecological, that it is environmental, uh, societal um, and economic. All three of those things have to be sustainable in order to actually achieve a, a society that self-governs, that maintains itself in a, in a way below the amount of resources um, we can naturally use. And just following that that thread on kind of modern society, how what's the role that sustainability in all of its forms has um, in kind of a, a modern society today? Hmm. So I like to say that sustainability, it's all about the ability to sustain things. I mean, it's in the word. Um, and so currently, it's probably more of an ideal, an aspiration, to be honest, because um, we don't seem to have that ability to sustain things in the world, um, like global economies, prosperous societies, like social orders. Um, you know, it, we we are hitting you know quite a few bumps in the road, uh, and we have in the last uh, you know century and a half with the start of the industrial in, in, uh, revolution, certainly. So um, I think. Um, it is very much about learning and honing that skill uh, in the future about how to sustain things and also make the right decisions about what things do we want to sustain. Because so far, um, mankind has made the decision to sustain financial markets and GDP instead of prioritizing the environment or social justice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I love some of the work coming out of um, well, two very different places right now. Bhutan, um, the country in Asia, on their redefining uh, their core metric as a com country away from GDP and towards G, I think it's GBH or GNH, gross national happiness as a better um, measurement that. of living. Um, and also, I'm curious to get your thoughts on on the idea that sustainability is almost a bit misleading as a term. Um, I think there's some great work coming out of uh, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, which argues that as a term, sustainability maybe argues a little too much for maintaining the status quo, keeping yeah. things as they are, and that actually there's more positive transformation that needs to happen as well. Where do you sit on that kind of debate? I was, yeah, I was actually going to add to what Lisa was saying before, so I guess it links here. For me, I've started to see it less as like sustainability. It's again, like a, a term I've always toyed with and a little bit more about regenerative, regenerative, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily just sustaining what we have now and ensuring, you know, that that doesn't completely deplete, but it's about regenerating and ensuring that with you know it's not so for example net zero great but what about net positive like there's so much more that can be done and obviously there's there's a way to get there um but yeah i think i think that word does have a lot of um kind of not negative connotations but there could be so much more done with it so if, yeah for me regenerating is is much more um the way i like to personally look at it i really like that one i really like the idea of uh kind of a regenerative society that sounds a lot better than maintaining the status quo that we have today and clearly this is something that you're both you've both given a lot of thought to you're both passionate about so I'm curious um what drives you as individuals to be so passionate about this topic well um I mean we we are the first generation to I guess be really acutely aware um not just aware but um impacted by by the crisis that we're in and uh, I mean it's been said a lot elsewhere we're I guess the last generation that can do anything about it um so when when that really that thought really hit me um 
I thought I, I kind of have to get involved on some level. And then just hearing in the news that, uh, you know, all those kind of floods or, or heat uh, events that, that Nikita mentioned earlier um, are, I don't know, up to five, eight, ten times more likely uh, because of uh, the climate crisis. That really makes me think that this concerns my, me personally and not just, you know, the people far, far removed on other continents. And I think that's something that there's been a lot of discussion about recently as well. Uh, the idea that up until now, the people most impacted by the climate crisis, by a lack of sustainability, are the, the same people who have probably the, the least ability to do anything about it. Um, but now I think we are, and it sounds like it's part of um, the decision that you've made to involve yourself in this professionally, that's creeping closer that it's our collective responsibility to do something about it. I guess on that point of collective responsibility, mm. be a good time to transition to the Young Person Sustainability Collective. So for anyone who hasn't heard of it yet, what is this? Yeah, good, good question. I mean, it, it is essentially a, we're, we're a group of kind of roughly 10 um, like-minded individuals, all with the idea that, yeah, this isn't a fight that um, everyone should fight individually. It's something that needs collective effort, um, collective input. But also we know that as young people, um, it can be quite difficult sometimes to, I don't know, approach senior members of your team or um, bring things up within your companies or, or outside. And essentially, we just want to kind of help and empower young people like ourselves to to bring to bring that up and to help drive forward the the change that market research could have because we kind of we're of the belief that we sit in a really unique um sector in the sense of like we work a lot with brands and a lot of with people and we're the voice of consumers and it's a really nice middle point to kind of yeah bring sustainability and sustainability into um I don't know if there's anything else to add there Lisa no, I think that's that's exactly uh, right. We're very much at the intersection of all other industries. Uh, we work with clients from well, depending on you know who you work for, um, like really social socially conscious brands, all the way up to uh, the big consultancies and even oil and gas players. And I know there is uh, definitely a discussion, a heated debate on whether or not you should work work with them um, and on what projects. But the position that we're in, I think, enables us um to you know to to ask those questions um and maybe even change the answers uh like under which circumstances are you supposed and not supposed to work with oil and gas companies what is what is that that cut off uh when can you believe them that they're actually trying to uh, change something for the better and then using using insights i mean that's what we're all about like finding out um you know how people feel what motivates them, how they act and why. And that's exactly the kind of things that can help us create positive action going forward when it comes to sustainability as well. And it, you've already touched on this, um, and I think there's some great examples uh, that you've given already, but what are some of the things that you hope in kind of, when you reflect in two, three, five years time, that the collective will kind of achieve over that sort of time period? I mean, we, we have uh, thought about this a lot, I think, when we fought, when we first came together um, and we have a few, I guess, guiding guiding principles. So we, we know, you know, we have something that we really want to commit to and work towards to um, just to give you an example. One of the things that we, we want to achieve is um, net zero as an industry, but I think it was 2026. Uh, and really empower young researchers um, to to help us get there. For example, by um, giving them templates, materials to go to their, um, you know, seniors in in the company, their CEOs, and and ask them, well, are we involved in any net zero pledges? And if not, we think for X, Y, Z reasons, now is the time to to get involved. Absolutely, and that sounds great. Um, the idea of both empowering young people and driving that behavior change within the sector as well. And then I guess you know that's quite a 
compared to some countries, that's quite an ambitious timeline um, when we've got kind of 2050 net zero targets. So is there an ambition to to go beyond that as well, that by 2030, we're not talking about net zero anymore, but we are talking more net positive contributions? Yeah, I think so, for sure. I guess we wanted to uh, not um, be overly ambitious. I think it's like a tight tight like a a tight rope to to walk on because yeah you know we there are there are really big ambitions to be net net positive or so many other things with like the global sustainability goals and I think one of the things that can be really frustrating with that is when you know we have these goals and then they're not met and then they just trickle on and they trickle on they trickle on and it's just kind of a a vicious cycle of not really achieving anything so obviously there are ambitions to 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 do much bigger and much better but i think we are kind of yeah we want to at least have like a minimum that we want to achieve and not um not be i don't know if it, i guess not be greenwashy um it's definitely not the type the right term to use but similar similar kind of thing like we want to walk uh, walk the walk as well as talk the talk and on that note, are you able to share some of the work that you've done so far since um, founding the collective? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think I already um, mentioned an example of that um, CEO letter. Um, that was part of a, a LinkedIn series that we did last year about basically how to take action as a young researcher in your company to try and uh, affect change. And um, what posts were in there, um, others as well, uh, how to reject a project on ethical grounds, or if you have any um, concerns, for example, about greenwashing implications, uh, about how to how to ask the right questions in an interview when you're considering to work for a company, how can you find out what's their stance uh, on sustainability? Um, because it's a two way street, really, it's, uh, they, they give you work, but <laughs> you you will give them well your time and basically your values and so you have to check you know whether there is an alignment or not and so uh, by creating those materials we're gonna try and help young researchers um be more informed when making those decisions in their career and so you've shared some of the work that you've done what can researchers do to support you and your goals um I think it's about kind of giving us the platform and following, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, following with some of the things we want to do. So, for example, things like adding sustainability questions into projects, it can be a difficult thing to do. And, you know, there is a certain brief that you have and there are certain things you need to ask. But maybe, you know, sometimes as a more junior member of, of your team, you may not want to challenge that brief but you could have a conversation with you know other researchers who are higher up than you who do have a little bit more say in that and have that conversation and hope you know that 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 you're heard and that they will kind of help you challenge that um so i think it's about aiding us to to bring our voices to the table and to have a bit of a stronger stance on it where i guess potentially it can sometimes be scary or um cautious to do so yeah, definitely. I'm sure a lot of people listening will resonate with that kind of fear of, um, you know, standing out, sticking their neck out on the line to be the one who says, actually, maybe we should be looking at this instead. Yeah. Um, are there any particular projects that you've seen worked on, are aware of that kind of inspire you and what you as the YPSC hope to achieve? So we were, yeah, we were toying with this question and, and going back and forth about it a little bit. So not necessarily things that we have personally worked of, on, um, but there are a couple things that I think are really inspirational. So one of them, which is more of an initiative like ourselves, which is the Purpose Disruptors. So I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but they're um, essentially a, a similar kind of collective group. And their mission is um, focused on the advertising industry. So obviously advertising is something that massively drives consumption um, and they are responsible for, for a lot of kind of the UK's carbon footprint. So they have a huge amount of initiatives within within their, their kind of um, 
advertising industry to do to do similar work to what we kind of do so things like challenging the brief or changing the brief um and um reporting kind of emissions and stuff like that which is really going to be super useful to kind of get people more um understanding and educated on a lot of those kind of terms so like carbon footprint i think is still something that is not widely understood um and then we were discussing uh patagonia as well what um what they've done i think lisa can lisa can voice that one a little bit more um, yeah, I think uh, at the time when the news came out uh, when, within our um, YPC Slack channel, that was that was a big conversation uh, when when the founder announced that uh, all of the company's profit uh, would go into saving the planet, into fighting uh, climate change. When he gave up uh, his ownership and his shares and redistributed it to well what, what we need to do, frankly. So I think that was just a really good example of how a company doesn't just talk to talk, but actually, um, you know, follows up by walking the walk. Definitely. I think those are really good examples of how industries and individual brands can make a, a difference in this space. But I am curious as well, what do you believe the role of research and insight is specifically in the climate conversation? I think we touched on it um, a little bit earlier. So um, in a nutshell, I would say you know, market research, it's its about understanding um, how people tick and why they, they think, feel and act the way that they do. Um, and as consumers, we make choices as to you know, what products to buy, um, what means of travel to use when we go on holiday, etc. And, and all of that is driven by conscious and subconscious um, thoughts and emotions. And all of that, all of what we do has an impact on the planet and society and so by asking the questions that market research does we can um we can play a role in i guess opening the that black box that is human behavior and thoughts and feelings and just try and make sure that whatever future decisions are made about sustainability are informed by what actually matters to people and uh what and trying to avoid any pitfalls, for example, not to not to uh, make consumerism worse. I, re I really liked something you said in there about um, being placed to ask the questions. I think something that it's easy to lose sight of is everything we do it, it is within a predefined system, is within a context that's built by humans. Uh, market research as an industry kind of exists within that system traditionally to find out you know what's going to be the most profitable course of action but it doesn't have to i think if we you know we have the opportunity to some extent to guide what questions we're asking to guide what those principles are to not put profitable behavior at the top of the pile and i think that's something that we've kind of mentioned a few times throughout this interview um and hopefully something that gives people listening pause for thought but on an individual level, I know you mentioned consumerism there as well, Lisa. What extent, to what extent is sustainability an individual consumer challenge? To what extent is it about our, you know, our actions as individuals versus one about institutions and brands and collective behaviors? Yeah. Um again, I think it's really great to have individuals you know doing what they can in terms of I don't know reduction and and all those kind of things and there are a lot of efforts that can be made to help what we are facing but I think we are of the belief that it's not necessarily something that is for individuals we kind of think that it's more it's it's much more about businesses and brands and governments taking responsibility to do something. And again, that's like, that is kind of why we came together as a collective to, to do that. Um, so things like, you know, the um, extended um, EPR, I can't remember the, the exact term for it. Um, those kind of government initiatives are going to be what really kind of force the most change. Um, and, you know, the, the massive brands having more of a stance and kind of 
I think for me, it's a, it's a lot about taking taking the choice out of something or, or just making it more ingrained, the sustainable option, the easy option. So don't ask people if they want it, just do it. That's That's kind of my stance on it. Yeah, I would say mine is similar. And, you know, as, as a collective, we would definitely say um, the, the actions and the change has to come uh, on a large scale from the institutions. But Chris, as you said before, you know, we all live in this predefined system. Uh, and so, you know, all of our systems that we have, like money, our political systems, our economies, like those are all just made up. Right. They don't exist in nature. Um, humans just basically we all build ourselves these these stories to make the more and more complex world work for us in, in you know, bigger and bigger societies. And obviously it's it's hard to change these institutions and it certainly isn't going to happen overnight. And that's why I think individuals have a role to play, um, because as more and more people, for example, decide to just re reduce their meat consumption or um, take the train instead of a flight if they're going from London to Edinburgh, whatever, then um, that will eventually create a momentum that is big enough so that these institutions can't ignore it. So individual by individual, you gain strength in numbers. So I think ultimately the institutional challenge goes hand in hand with the individual choices that we can make. And you've very nicely teed up my last question for today, which is, as individuals, given the scope and the challenge ahead of us, especially on the, the institutional behavioural change front, what are some of the things that people listening today can do to build a more sustainable society? Yeah, I guess it's, it's some of the things, like Lisa said, like, I think it's about having that more conscious train of thought and having forethought with your behaviors it is ultimately about behavior change and it takes a lot to do that so yeah things like reducing meat consumption or thinking a little bit before you buy things is could is there something that's better to buy do you need to buy it all those really um kind of simple changes but again they require that forethought so I think it's just about being more conscious and having the conversation more so for us it's all about bringing it up in market research what about other industries can you have that conversation within your industry where you work what could your company do all of those small things that yeah require an individual to to kind of grow their army in 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 one way uh, you've hit on one of my favorite marketing concepts there uh, that it's almost about giving uh, sustainability in these issues more salience the more we talk about it the harder it is to ignore the more it will become the default option yeah well we have come to about our time limit today but before we go yeah I'd love to just get one final thought from each of you so Lisa I'll come to you first what's the one thing you'd like people to take away to remember from today's episode? That an individual choice can create institutional change. Mm -hmm. um, if we all make our work, do our work and make our individual choices. And Nikita, what would you like someone to take away from today's episode? Um... I think for me, it's a little, it's more about kind of maybe you're starting off in your career and, you know, there, there's something that, that you want to do and you want your voice heard um, and it can be really scary to do so, but there are resources that can help you and actually giving yourself that platform and um, making your voice heard can make a huge world of difference, even if that's just within the place that you work or within your circle, um, I think having that kind of little push and confidence to do so can, yeah, really make a world of difference. Some great final points to end on. Nikita, Lisa, thank you so much again for joining me today. And thank you to everybody listening as well. If you do want to find out more about the Young Person Sustainability Collective, we will have links to all the social media accounts and places you can find them on the web in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. And we'll be back with another episode of the MRX Lab next month 
joined by Sherry, Elise, and Andrew Cannon from the Art and Science of Joy to revisit how the year of joy is spreading happiness across the world in 2023. Until then, I've been your host, Chris Martin, and this has been the Emirates Lab. Thank you.